stock market talks to me. And I mean that figuratively, not literally. I mean, contrary to what you may have read on Twitter, I do not hear voices. Although periodically I think that my left molar crown does play some music. But that's all we're talking about here. I'm constantly listening to the tape, not music, to get a read on what the big institutional money managers are up to. And to do that, I need to separate the signal from the noise. Okay, what do I mean by that? Uh, on any given day, there might be monster moves in individual stocks. It's tempting to assume that all these swings are equally significant. So when you see the cloud stocks get killed, for, you, you, well, your natural conclusion to draw is that something must be wrong with the cloud. When a really loath group bounces, it's not much of a stretch to assume that maybe the pain is at last oh, over. Pain. But that's just too easy, people. The truth is some of these moves are a signal, and some of them or noise. Signal means something. It tells you that the stock will probably keep moving the same direction. Noise, on the other hand, is uh, noise. To borrow a line from one of my favorite characters, Macbeth, noise is a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. In other words, while a signal carries a message, there's no real takeaway from noise. In another life, Shakespeare would have been just a dino might investor. Distinguishing the one from the other is as much an art as, as science. So how do you tell when a major stock swings are, are really herald something larger or should be ignored? Before we get into what makes a move meaningful, you need to understand that we get major single-day advances and declines with no real significance all the time, although we try to read some into it. Good stocks can get ahead of themselves, rallying too far too fast before selling off. The technical term for this is called overbought, and charters measure it with the slow stochastic oscillator, or the Williams percentage R oscillator. We talk about these on Tuesdays and off the charts. When you're overbought, it means pretty much everybody who wants the stock at a given level has already purchased it. Even the highest quality company can have an overbought stock. And when you run out of buyers, you almost always get a pullback. But this kind of overbought sell-off doesn't tell you anything other than the fact that the stock in question needed to take a breather and digest the gains. At the same time, even bad stocks can rally, and for similar reasons. If they get oversold because they've come down too quickly, you need to get a nice oversold bounce. Once again, though, this is the sort of rally that doesn't convey much information. It's technical. It's noise. A stock got oversold, it bounced. And unless something else changes, it can go right back down once it works off that bounce. That's that thing you see uh, uh, head and shoulders go down and down and, uh, with some ridges. I bring this up because when you see dramatic swings in individual stocks, your mind will try to draw a conclusion, and uh, it, it connects to the fundamentals. The real-world facts about how the underlying company is actually doing. You think that somehow they relate. Sometimes that connection does generally exist. Other times, the action in the stock is noise, not a signal. And you'll end up feeling very foolish if you take your cue from that kind of action. Those who want to know more about this can go back to the canon on stock markets right here. Wow. Early release, no doubt. <laughs> Confessions of a Street Act tells all. It's where I describe how easy it is to see a stock move a point and convince yourself something's really happening underneath. I describe a move of a point, an anatomy of one point gain. You will love it. All that really happens is that you have more buyers than sellers at a given moment in a way that may be totally unrelated to the actual company. Disturbing, don't you think? Always thought so. Of course, it's not just the technicals. There are plenty of other reasons why a stock might explode higher, melt down, that have nothing to do with the fundamentals at all. Sometimes the market simply makes a mistake, and that mistake gets rolled back. No greater significance. I want you to consider for a moment the cloud computing stocks after Salesforce, the most majestic of the cloud kings, told us to be acquiring Tableau software symbol data for an enormous premium in an all stock transaction. At first, the pin action. From the Tableau deal was very positive. Investors figured that all the other cloud plays might be a potential takeover targets too. ServiceNow, Workday, Adobe, Coupa Software, Twilio, Okta, Zscaler, Zendesk. They all roared higher on rampant takeover speculation. However, the very next day, the cloud stocks came right back down. I mean, they were really obliterated. Because surprise, surprise, the Salesforce Tableau tie-up was more of a one-off transaction. Salesforce needed a, da a data analytics platform, and they had a unique opportunity here, which is why they agreed to pay such a huge premium. They had cloud data analytics. Well, Salesforce wanted them. When Wall Street realized that the other cloud plays probably weren't going to be bought anytime soon, their stocks just plummeted. Oh, a brutal day. And once again, it meant nothing. The only takeaway from that cloud pullback was that they never should have been up in the first place because the Tableau News was, again, sui generis, as we would say at law school. So what kind of action carries real significance? How do you know when a big move is foreshadowing something even bigger? 
All right, there's a lot of signal that's obvious. A company reports a blowout quarter, and its stock course, obvious. An analyst cuts estimates, stock plummets, obvious. That's just business as usual. And it's why I like to look for the unusual. A company catches an analyst downgrade and their stock goes up, ooh, interesting signal counterintuitive. In my experience, when a stock refuses to go lower on bad news, it often means that stock is putting in a significant bottom and it's ready to rocket higher. I like that. By the same token, when a company reports a fantastic quarter with great guidance and bullish conference call, yet the stock gets slammed, oh boy, sell, 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 sell. It means Wall Street believes that this company is looking at its last good quarter. That happens very often. When your stock falls on positive news, i got to tell you something. That is the definition of a possible top. For the most part, though, you can't decipher hidden messages in, in the way stocks are trading, except in some rare cases you probably shouldn't even try. It's important to know what's working and what's not working in any given matter, in any given market. But you can't let your money management decision be, complete, be completely guided by what's in or out of style on the Wall Street fashion show. I always tell you that. Otherwise, you end up owning stocks just because they're going higher. Oh, that's a terrible place to be because you don't know what to do when they inevitably start coming down. The bottom line. When you're evaluating a stock, take your cue from the fundamentals of the underlying company. Don't put too much significance on day-to-day gyrations in the share price. Sometimes you, get, you can extrapolate a great deal from a big move in an individual stock. But more often, it's telling you something you already know, or it's just noise that means nothing. Let's go to Dell in Florida. Dell! Booyah, Kramer. First time, long time here from the University of Florida. Whoa, love that. Go Gators. Hey, yeah. Hey, in your book, Real Money, you say that a company doing an in-the-hole secondary is not one you want to be invested in. So I'm wondering, is this rule without exception, or are there circumstances where it's okay for a not-yet-profitable company to do a secondary offering and expand while they can? If there is a particular piece of news that is driving the stock up and it's really positive news and they do a secondary, I might get behind it on a little case-by-case. But typically, you know, I'm just uh, I'm sus- I'm suspicious. I'm critical. And that's the way to play it. How about Aditya in Ohio? Aditya. Booyah, Jim. Booyah. I'm a longtime listener, and I appreciate you taking my call. Oh, come on, Aditya. I love it. What's going on? <laughs> so you always suggest uh, owning index funds in a portfolio. Absolutely. And my, my question for you is two-part. One, what percentage of my portfolio should be in index funds versus individual equities? And number two, you also suggest owning index funds that track the S&P. Do you also indi- also suggest that you should own sector-related index funds in addition to a general S&P, for example, in healthcare? Right. No, I definitely don't want sector-related. I think that those are wrong. I want the full panoply. That's why I like the S&P 500. I think that it should be 85 to 90 percent index fund. The rest is your mad money for individual stocks that you can still make a lot of uh, make a lot of money in. But no, index funds are the bedrock. I wish it weren't the case, but you know what? I got to be worried too. I do think individual stocks with a lot of homework can make you more money. Though. All right, fundamentals matter. Not day-to-day moves. There's much more mad money ahead. I'm offering a word of warning for the next time we see a big wave of upcoming IPOs. Oh, you're not going to want to miss this. Then, you may want to do the right thing, but if it's for the wrong reason, uh, well, it'll cost you. I'll explain. And I'm taking your questions tweet by tweet. So send them my way with hashtag MadTweets and stay with Chris. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.